Hello out there and welcome to this really special book launch for a really special book. I'm Eric Lorber, the director of Rain Taxi. We're a nonprofit organization that champions aesthetically adventurous literature through a quarterly print magazine of critical writing, as well as through a robust online presence, events both virtual and in-person throughout the year, and many other programs. Please visit us after this event at raintaxi.org to learn more. Whether you're an occasional visitor or you'd like to become a member, we'd love to have you along for the ride. To do everything we do, Rain Taxi receives partial funding from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Minnesota State Arts Board. Their support helps keep most of Rain Taxi's events, like this one, free to attend. But our most vital support actually comes from individual readers like you. So if you're able to pitch in a little something, please hit that donate button at the bottom of your screen and know that even a small gift makes a big difference. There are many other ways to participate on screen. A lot of you are chiming in on the chat. Thank you for that and keep all your wonderful comments and observations coming in. If you have a question for the author and the artist, you can put that in the ask a question box. We're gonna be getting to as many of those as possible toward the end of the event. And the best button of all is the one that says buy the book. <laughs> and remember that when you purchase a book at a literary event, you are supporting, there it is, you're supporting not only the author and their publisher, but also the event host and a great independent bookstore based in a great actual community. And tonight, that's our friends at Majors and Quinn Booksellers in Minneapolis. Cress Watercress, a book that is uh, an instant classic without a doubt. <laughs> We're going to be hearing a DUI today. Uh, the author, Gregory McGuire, he's been enchanting audiences since the mid 90s and wicked. Uh, the artist is David Litchfield, beaming in all the way from England. Uh, his luminous illustrations that bring Gregory's writing to life in a miraculous way. And the moderator is the one and only Anne Patchett, novelist, essayist, children's book author herself, and the proprietor of a great independent bookstore in Nashville, Parnassus Books. Welcome to you all. Thank you for being here. A joy to help bring Crest Watercrest in the world. Take it away. Thank you, Eric. Hello, Gregory. Hello, David. Hello, Anne. Hi, Anne. So excited to do this. And um, I do loads of author events and not usually for books for younger readers. But when I got my copy of Crest Water Crest um, and I picked it up, it came to my house and not the bookstore. And I thought, I really, really want to read this book because of the cover. <laughs> which is such an odd thing because Gregory and I are friends and I didn't see your name. Not, I mean, I just wasn't, I wasn't looking for it. I just fell in love with the title and with the rabbit and with this luminous, luminous jacket. So I feel a great connection to both of you because you know, I'm going to read everything that Gregory writes, but David, you're actually the reason that I picked this book up. Oh, and I okay. that, that you're the reason that so many people are going to be reaching for this book. So, so David, I'm going to start with you. Light, man, where did you learn how to do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Anne. But you, we all know you should never judge a book by its cover, but... Thankfully. There is no other way. There, there <laughs> well, no that's true. Way. That's true. <laughs> Thankfully, we all know that the, the story was, was bound to be amazing because uh, Gregory obviously wrote it. But um, but no, light is important for me. It's, um, it's something I like playing with. It's something I like experimenting with. Um, but it, it comes from two sources, really. It, uh, one of them is, um, is Steven Spielberg. <laughs> so, like, I grew up loving the films of Steven Spielberg and how he uses light in those films. It's, you oh, know, wow. it's a, it's very emotive and it helps move the narrative along. And, you know, it, it's kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a storytelling tool in itself. I think how Steven Spielberg and other filmmakers who, you know, he obviously was inspired by. 
so yeah, that comes from that, you know, growing up watching those films like E.T. and Close Encounters of Third Kind and all these great films going, and turn it into something just completely, you know, amazing. And, you know, just through simple shading and kind of using a rubber or an eraser to kind of, you know, take some of the edge off. And so, yeah, it just comes from those two, two sources, really. It's two childhood influences, one being Steven Spielberg and then one slightly less glamorous, but all, you know, absolutely up there in my estimation in terms of being an artist is Mr. White, who was my art teacher at Hastings Re uh, School in, in Bedford, where I, where I am now. How, how old were you when you met Mr. White? I was about, uh, well, actually I was getting quite old. I was like 13 because he was my upper school art teacher. And I, I mean, it, it must have been shown to me before the power of shading and using light and shade. But he just had a, a, a way of simplifying it, I guess, and saying, look, this is what you can do to your drawings if you just use these kind of techniques. And the power it can give your 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 art is kind of immeasurable, right? It's like, a, it, and it was, it opened up, I, I remember it very vividly, it kind of opened up a whole new realm of what I could do with my art. And, you know, I could not only just making it look 3D and more lifelike, but just kind of, you know, what you could play around with textures and colors and kind of, you know, incorporate them into the light and things. And, you know, I haven't looked back at all those years ago. It's kind of, you know, it's uh, all those kind of teachings of Mr. White really do stick with me. So, yeah. That's amazing. Gregory, did you have a Mr. White? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I did. Uh, but Mr. White was probably uh, every author of every book that I read between oh, second grade and say tenth grade. Mm. Uh, but before I go into that, I want to I want to ask David a question about oh, please too, because you're right. The book does begin with the cover, and this is this is a particularly arresting and inviting cover, even to me. And I know what's in the book. <laughs> I like to think I like to think it lives up to the cover. That's for readers to decide. <laughs> <laughs> What I think, because people have asked me, I've been giving interviews now for a few weeks uh, prior to today, and people have said, you know, what, what do you, David Litchfield, like, where did you find him? And, and <laughs> how did he know what to do with this? And, and what is it? Uh, you know, it's like, it's almost as if one of those things you can get at the Museum of Modern Art where you open the book and the light actually emanates out of the page. That's right. Oh, wow. That's exactly what I was expecting. <laughs> I have I have one I have one or two of those myself. Uh, but my my analysis for people who have who have asked me my emotional reaction to David's contribution, his major contribution to this book, is it's as if David went into some desacralized, decommissioned 19th century late Victorian English church and took some stained glass windows, not the sacred ones, but the ones that pictured the great burgers of the, of the village, let's say, and took off out all the glass and put it in a cuisine art and pressed pulse only about three times. Because what comes out, I've never seen color on a page and I love art. I, was all, I wanted to be an illustrator before I wanted to be a wow, writer. Okay. Uh, I've never seen printed art radiant like this printed art is and i, I, and I i'm really i'm really curious about the technique i mean i i want to talk Ooh. about my book too but i really <laughs> this is what i wanted to talk to you about like how, how, <laughs> how did you take any one of those images and why don't you show us one show us show us your favorite if you can is that Ooh. all right Dan? is that too early to jump into looking no at we can do that i'm sure yeah. I'm i just need to get technical which is always scary um but let's go uh, share. Sorry, I'm going to just talk through what I'm doing. Share yeah. screen. There we go. We'll come back okay, to so, story later. <laughs> yeah, I've got um, I've got a few lined up on here. This is the first one, which I think is one of your selections, actually, Gregory. Um, but yeah, this is from the uh, the tree. Now, this is probably a good one to answer your question in the funny because yeah, you know, there is some light kind of techniques going on. But also there's quite a bit of texture involved in this one. Mm -hmm. um, and this is kind of how um, I, I really like to work with as many different kind of forms of art making materials as possible. And I, I really, and again, this is going back to, you know, Mr. White art lessons in, in the 90s. 
um, where we would just be encouraged to just throw as much, kind of make as much mess as possible, basically, and kind of, you know, just just kind of, you know, fill fill the piece with colour and fill it with texture and, you know, every kind of square centimetre of, of an image should be interesting and it should have some something going on in it. And as you can see, the background here, um, we're kind of at the edge of the forest and you know, at the at the point of, of when we when we come to this this lovely beautiful tree, um, and um, it was well I did I mean I might be I might have been this might be in the text or I might have been reading between the lines here but I didn't want there to be too much information about what was past that point mm -hmm. it, so I kind of wanted it to be kind of like you know hues and mist and kind of you know mis mystery. <laughs> as well um so yeah i mean what we got there is is um basically we've got a mixture of kind of real world artwork so the background is uh, an acrylic wash so acrylic paint just kind of splattered all together um and then the tree is a a a, 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 a well the outline is pen and ink so very traditional pen and ink drawing which exists somewhere in a sketchbook somewhere um and then uh, the actual bark is um, a, a photograph of bark. So a close up photograph of a tree from Bedford Park, just up the road from my house. Um, and then the floor, I think, I'm trying to think now, that was, was quite a while ago. The floor is like a watercolor wash because watercolor, you can obviously blend the colors quite nicely and get this kind of very natural kind of grassy feel. And then I scan all of that in to my computer and then spend a day or a day or two just experimenting, kind of throwing them together. Um, a little bit of trial and error, you kind of see what happens when you work like that, but that's kind of part of the fun of it. Um, and yeah, then kind of tweaking and kind of, you know, so that it, it starts off in the real world, basically, with kind of you know, paint and ink and pencil, crayons and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I combine it using using uh, Photoshop and computer programs like that. So it's a mixture of real world art and digital work, uh, work which is just the way that I've just found is how I enjoy, enjoy working. Now, it's only fairly recently I've been working like that. I used to be much more traditional, but again, finding the digital realm opened up this whole new, this whole new realm for my, for my work. Does that make That's sense? Hopefully. That's, that's, that's really e extraordinary to hear. And what it reminds me of is that um, years ago, and in a way, and I'm going back to your question about who was my Mr. White. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was not being either, uh, I wasn't being fawning or facetious when I said it was the writers that I read in the library. Uh, my parents were, were both very um, uh, articulate and verbal okay. people. Uh, they were... Uh, they were cautious about television. They kept it from us as much as they could. They thought it had a corrupting influence, not on our morals, but on our aesthetic sensibilities. <laughs> and uh, we were not a prosperous family, but our, our real liberty of life was the, the library card rather sure. than the two-wheeler bicycle or hours in front of the TV. That was what we had. <laughs> and that was what I used. So one of the, one of my Mr. Whites, was a writer deceased only in the last couple of years ago, a children's book and adult mystery writer named Jane Langton. She wrote a book called The Diamond in the Window, published in about 63 or 64. It was my one of my top 10 favorite books through childhood. And uh, she, she lived, she wrote about Concord, Massachusetts and lived in Concord, Massachusetts for a time and in our next door town, Lincoln. And it's one of the reasons why I have raised my family in Concord, Massachusetts, because I became enamored with the, the kind of mystery and evanescence and transcendentalism in a key suitable for children that she was able to communicate in a book. So hmm. years after I read that book and had read it maybe 40 times, I saw her address someplace in a newspaper and I thought, God wants me to be in touch with her. <laughs> I wrote to her at her home address and she said, if you're ever in Massachusetts, come see me. So I wrote back and said, yes, I'll be there in two weeks uh, and made wow. a special trip so that I could meet her. Uh, eventually, she's the reason I moved to Boston. 
And I took a course with her, my only course in writing that I ever took. I've never belonged to a writing group. I'm sort of skeptical of writing groups, mm -hmm. but I had come to Boston to live in her company in a way. So I did take this course. And I remember, this is back to your artwork, David. I remember her saying those decades and decades ago, 40 years ago, saying, there are many ways to write a book, but there are at least two ways that everybody can understand. And they're analogous to making sculptures. There's the kind of sculpture that children make with Play-Doh, which is uh, adding daubs and building up. And right. the Modigliani um, walking uh, people, uh, stretched out and, and full of scar and uh, yeah. addendum and afterthought. And then there's the Michelangelo method, which is to take a perfect piece of marble and find an even more perfect form right. inside it and to take away anything that isn't that perfect form. So, David, your description of it sounds to me like the Play-Doh, you know, yes. kindergarten method, <laughs> which oh, really, really seems appropriate because most of my life, that's been my method in writing, too, oh, well, not for this think... book. This book... Right was something different for me. And oh, really? Oh, wow, added, okay. We came at it with different construction methods for what it is yeah. we were going to end up with. Maybe that's part of what gives it some some, yeah. some yeast and some vigor or something. I don't, I don't yeah. know. Absolutely, absolutely agree. I mean, so I, 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 I totally do use the Play-Doh technique, 100%, there's no question about it. You know, I have a vague idea and, you know, I sketch them out and, you know, I've got thumbnail sketches of what, around about what I'm aiming for. But the great fun thing about it is, and I think this might, possibly might be how, how some of your writing works. I, I remember reading an interview with you fairly recently where it's like, you know, you start and it can go off in different kind of routes and tangents that you absolutely were not expecting. And that is absolutely part of the fun of, of creating, I think, is, just kind of starting it and just seeing where it goes, seeing where you know the artwork takes you. Right. Right. So Gregory, in this story, why did you decide to use this other method? Why, the, why did you switch to the Michelangelo method? Uh, the theme of the story is always where I start. It's, I don't like to think of books as being didactic, but I do like to think of books. And I'd be wondered, especially novels, I wonder whether you agree with me or whether your method is, your intention is the same. The, the, the thing that motivates me across the threshold of my own personal panic and anxiety about making anything is not that I have a message to sell to an unsuspecting public, but that I have a big question for myself yes. that I would like to see whether I can answer. And yes. if I can answer it for myself, perhaps it's an answer for somebody else, or perhaps it isn't. But it, but but writing a story is my way of examining life. It's my way of, of investigating my own life. And with, with luck, you know, it benefits somebody else. But at any rate, I came to this story. It came to me pretty much, not, not whole and entire. All that came to me was the situation. But the, but the situation followed my sense of a need. And I'm going to tell you an origin story now for this book. Mm -hmm. About four years ago, I was at a conference in, in Vermont, a conference I go to every year. And I became enamored with uh, an illustrator whose work was uh, replete with beautiful animals, great art, a lovely art. And I said kind of jovially, gee, I wish I wrote stories about animals because it would be great to work together. Uh, and he said, well, I wish you did too. And I said, sadly, I don't. Uh, <laughs> then I got in the car and I had a four hour drive. My mind went to all different things in that drive. And without, without betraying any confidences of people near or far, I will say that in my life of many decades, I have had many young people uh, across my threshold. I have lots of godchildren. I have lots of honorary godchildren. I have my own children and my six brothers and sisters and all their children, nieces. I mean, it's just the world is stuffed and screaming with children. <laughs> and I've watched them for most of my life. I love children, always have done. That's why I write for them. But I have noticed that you sometime between uh, the onset of the first hair on the lip and uh, one's ability to bail oneself out of jail because one has enough money in the bank, uh, 
there, there comes a point where some great crisis arrives. It might be the, a first death. It might be the collapse of a first romance. It might be a health problem. It could be any one of the 150,000 things that bedevil young people and old people all the time, and usually simultaneously. What I was thinking about one particular child is this. If this child were not 19 or 18 or 15, whatever it was at the time, I would love to be able to give a book that would explain something about the complexities of the feeling life. Mm -hmm. But there are two problems. One is that I can't think of the right book. Mm -hmm. The second is that this child is not a reader, never was much of a reader, but is no longer a reader and may never be a reader. Not everybody is a reader and not everybody takes nourishment from books. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the stats are that, that most Americans do 90% of their reading for pleasure before the age of 18. Wow. And then, that's and then, shocking. I know, but I mean, I don't know if that's still real. It's probably 95% now. <laughs> but I thought, okay, I can't, I can't do much. I don't really believe in bibliotherapy, but I be do believe in, in books that, that ask questions. Um, and I thought, what, what I, I, I can only write the book I wish had been available mm -hmm. for this child so that at this point, there would have been some reading memory or some, some story memory about how it feels to be like this. Um, not to have a question that is answered by the end of the book, like, oh, it's my first death, but hey, on the last page, I see I'm going to survive. Not that, but the kind of thing that says, oh, my dear, holding all these emotions, yes, it's complicated. And when you're young and are encountering them one after another after another, you're kind of told by well-meaning adults, teachers, parents, librarians, ministers, whoever else, that um, you will get through it. And indeed, most, of, most likely you will. What is less often said is, and it will happen again. And then something else will happen. And then it will happen again. And uh, it's not just that it gets better, but it keeps on being hard. That, and I thought, one can live despite that. One doesn't just survive trauma. One actually learns that it has a life of its own and that emotions have lives of their own and that the whole system of emotional apprehension of the world is, it's a system like any other and it's a cycle. It's a cycle like seasons. And what you learn is you can ride that wave and still be yourself. Indeed, you, you, you change a little bit. So I was just wishing I could get that message to somebody who was too old, in fact, to receive it but to get it to anybody. And then that paired, before I got to the turn, before I got to the toll booths, it paired with the notion of, oh, I never write books about animals. And mm -hmm. by the time I pulled into my driveway, I had a rabbit family leaving their warren because something un unforetellable had happened to them and they needed to find their way through it. That's all that I knew, but I knew it was different for me. And I knew... My, my job in this book was going to be as honest about emotional panic and emotional reward, fun, laughter, jokes, laughing, adventure, but also loneliness and, and misunderstandedness and confusion and anger and frustration and fear and ambition. I wanted to, I wanted to get it all in a story about a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> And, and is it, do you feel like there's more space when you're writing about rabbits? Is there more freedom? And also then, David, is there more freedom in drawing rabbits than, than having a little girl on the cover in this dress? I'll, I'll, I'll answer first and then David can answer okay. uh, this one. Uh, what's really fun about rabbits, and here's where the freedom comes in, Anne, is... Uh, in, in the first three or four pages of the book, as this rabbit family leaves their private home, where they've been very comfortable and happy, and indeed one might say privileged, they have three rooms and a back door and a private carrot garden, 
but they have to leave because of family crisis and they have to move into that tree that David showed us. They move into an apartment tree and they mm -hmm. take a windowless ground floor, one room dwelling. That is a real come down for them. It's a, it's a step down and uh, uncomfortable and a little scary, but it's not the mother rabbit does it for the family's safety. Uh, as the family's leaving the Warren in the first four or five pages and traveling to their new digs, as it were, uh, the um, the rabbit sees the baby, the, the girl rabbit, whose name is Cress Watercress, sees the moon, and she says, "Oh, look, Mama, look at that!" And the mother says, "That's that's the moon, Cress. You've seen that before." And Cress says, "Oh, I don't remember." That shows how young she is. She's like a toddler. She has she has very little memory at the beginning of the book, and then at a, about 120 pages later. She gets really snarky and the mother says, mm -hmm. are you turning into a teenager already? You know, tell me, I have to take different vitamins if that's, you know, if that's what's happening to you. So the freedom in is that this rabbit child for me is toddler slash teenager mm -hmm. all at once, as most of us really are, but we just don't admit it. She's a toddler and she's a teenager. And I don't think I could carry that off if I had a human child, yeah. in the same kind of distress. So David, over to you. Well, it's interesting, really. Like, when I was coming up with the designs for Cress, it wasn't until I kind of put um, little tiny patches on her nose, little tiny patches that rabbits do have, right? Rabbits are covered in kind of all different colours patches. But for me, they represented um, freckles, um, even though they were rabbits, you know, the, the patches that you see on a rabbit. And I just, I, I felt like something like that, even though you're looking at a rabbit, um, you're, you're also seeing the, the young girl that the, this story is about, you know, and the fact that throughout the story, Cress is having to be as brave as anything. And, you know, she's having to become the teenager and become the adult in certain situations. Mm -hmm. um, those freckles for me still represent that actually she is a little girl and she is, you know, vulnerable and she's, in entering this brand new whole new reality for her um and i think that's something that you know a lot of kids will identify with this story um and that's the kind of magic of of books and children's books but books in general where it's like it's a story about a rabbit and there's beautiful color color and and you know all these other amazing characters in it but there's so much that you can identify, particularly with Cress, but also with the other characters. Um, as a child, but also as an adult, absolutely. There's so much of Cress I, I recognised in myself. Um, and, you know, my own story and um, uh, Ma as well. I'm totally 100% in support of Cress's mum. And now that I am a parent myself, um, you know, she, in fact, she's probably the one I identified with the most out of the entire book. Um, just the concern and how much freedom to give your children and how to, you know, when to kind of step in when there's the situation's gone horribly wrong. Um, and to sort of tell those universal stories that everyone recognises with these animals, I think is a, is a beautiful thing, definitely. And also... You know, rabbits really do grow up very, very fast. They do. They do. <laughs> if, you start, if you start with just a baby rabbit by a hot yeah. page 120, that rabbit is totally yeah. a teenager yeah. and probably pregnant. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> be a, someone asked me, not on a not on a, a Zoom interview, but but at some point in the last six weeks. I think it was a print interview question said, oh, this is so feeling. You must have lots of pets at home. And I said, no, I'm allergic to everything. I, I can't even have dust. Oh, really? I have no, I have no pets. I do like animals. Oh. I admire them from a distance, but I can't, <laughs> I can't get near your beautiful dog. And I'm afraid Sparky, oh. Sparky and I would have to be in different rooms. But so, but this, this poor reviewer, had the rug taken out from under him and, <laughs> and, and he said oh but surely surely you've known some rabbits and i said no and then i said oh yes there was one maybe this is where this story came from about 10 years ago or 15 years ago when my kids were little we were driving from france to geneva to visit some old friends of my husband's 
And we got out of the car after an arduous car ride. And uh, the, the, the host said, oh, Florence and Patrick are in the backyard by the rabbit hutch. And our kids went, oh. and, and, and they said, yes, we have a rabbit. The kids went thundering around oh. the alley and around the corner of the building and up to the rabbit hutch. And the rabbit died of terror. Oh, <laughs> no. oh really? Because these three thundering Americans pounding toward the cage. So I said, I thought maybe this is maybe Crest Watercrest is my apology yeah. that, to that rabbit. I just I didn't think of that until a couple of weeks ago. But so oh, wow, uh, yes, a rabbit heart attack. Sad. I, David, will you will you show us another spread? Because I I would love sure. to jump into this. One of the things that was really interesting to me about the last one you showed us was the framing. So you have those yeah. big leaves in the foreground and then little tiny rabbits in the middle ground and then the giant tree. And I think it's very novelistic, that sort of mm. that sort of framing setup. Yeah. Well I mean obviously this this is actually the the the, the biggest book I've worked on in a number of ways, but in terms of like the amount of pages. Um, so I don't know, there was, there was a conscious effort to kind of make as much as possible the images work in unison as kind of, you know, as well as I could really. Um, thankfully, I had a, an amazing uh, art director working with me and then called Amy Bernica um, at, at Candlewick. And, I mean, she was amazing and, you know, any kind of issues I would have with like, I'm not sure how, where the text is going to go on this spread or, you know, how I'm going to incorporate the image. She would just use some kind of Jedi mind trick thing and it just, it would just sort it all out. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was a consideration, absolutely, you know, and in many ways, it kind of was one of those things that goes against the kind of like, let's just throw paint at it and see what happens. Um, because, you know, occasionally I do have to actually think, well, actually, I need to leave some space for some of the text on, on some of these spreads because, you know, <laughs> especially when the text is interacting. Um, so, yeah, that, that was probably a, a minor tweak in my usual way of working. David, um, one of the things that I really uh, liked and find unusual about, about this book as a printed object, as, as, a, as a physical thing to live in our world, uh, well, there are two things. One is it is one of the most beautifully printed books I've seen in it a is. long time. It is it wow. is it was printed in Italy, and the paper yeah. is heavy, and the yeah. color it's doesn't really nice. move through. Um, mm. But but the other thing is, and this is this is up to you and the art director, is that I counted at least eight different ways that you incorporated art onto the page. There are full page spreads with text on them. There are drop-in ovals. There are drop-in squares. There are, you know, below-page bands like this one, double over double-page bands, and there are full-page, uh, one-side page portraits, mm. as it were, which possibly yeah. are, are my favorite. Can you show one of the ones of of Tunk, either the one with the antlers or or the, the Ooh, big yes. one, uh, because okay. that's of the big of the big one that hits you in the face and you think I don't know what this book is about but I have to have this book I mean, that's, that's, so, that's what it is to me even and I feel that way you know even though I know what the book is about and and <laughs> I would is, like to, oh wow oh my god what happens so to that what uh, David what happens to that piece of art do you then sell these pieces through a gallery well, are I, they in I've your only, house I've only today in fact been told but I am actually allowed to make prints of, of some of these um, pages. And I think that one I would like to, I would like to make a print of. Um, so, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I don't, you know, I think I want the, I want the book to exist as its own art form, its own piece of art. Um, but I think make, maybe making one or two prints of, of some of the images I, I would really like to do definitely. Could, could the two of you at some point, it doesn't have to be right this minute, but I want to I wanna know about how you met, because I think a lot of people don't understand how artists and illustrators are matched. Well, we are, in a sense, we meet thanks to Rain Taxi, 
uh, who put yeah. us together for today because we had not met before the, the tech rehearsal for this a couple of weeks ago. That's astonishing. I, I was shown uh, portfolios by the publisher and uh, I, uh, I chose David's out of the ones that they thought might work. Uh, but I was, you know, I'm kind of hard nosed. And I said, I love his work on numbers three, seven, 14, 15, and 19, but not the others. I mean, you know, I, I had very clear sense of wanting this abundant colorfulness and a sense of gravity and mystery as well as fun. Mm -hmm. David can do fun stuff and he can do things that are that are much lighter in nature and, and lighter on the page too. I really liked the, the deep, rich intensity. So I said, if you can, if you can persuade yourselves and then him that this tonal register is, is right, then I'll say, yes, let's go with him. And apparently they could. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, it's unusual that I, I've worked with around about 20 authors and I've only met about four of them in, in real life. Um, you know, a lot of things happen via emails. And obviously in the past two years, it's kind of been impossible to mm. meet most people in real life. Um, but yeah, it was an eye opener to me that that's kind of, I assumed these books were made, I'd be sitting in, in, in Gregory's office with him while he was writing and mm. I'll just draw while, while, it, while it came out of him. Right. You know, when you're growing up, you, you, you don't understand how the process works. So it was an eye opener for me as well. Um, but I guess it, it comes from the power of, of, of how this book was written is it, it didn't take me long to kind of grasp what Gregory was after and, and, you know, how I should approach it and, you know, the kind of, the kind of tone that the artwork should be in. And yes, I had um, Amy kind of guy, Amy was kind of the, the middle person between us for a while. So I'd send some stuff to Amy. Amy would send it to, to Gregory and, you know, it would kind of work that way. Um, which is kind of, the, you know, a very common way for, for this to, to work is sort of what I'm learning. Um, but, yeah. I, have a, I have a question for David and for Anne. And Anne, I, I know uh, you're the moderator, but... I am, that's right. We're very lucky to have you today. And <laughs> while you and I are friends, we haven't met very often. We're epistolary friends, mostly. And my, my question for both of you, really, is it's a very ordinary question. Uh, once I heard um, Robertson Davies and Russell Hoban on stage together at the ICA in London, and I got a ticket early. And I, by the time I got, I was in like row 75. Place was absolutely chocked. That what are these two geniuses of, of American and English literature going to talk about? How is an interview between these two high intellects going to go? And, and Robertson Davies came out and he looked like a, like a cross between Robinson Crusoe and Père Noel, you know, he was <laughs> magnificent. Wow. And, and Russell Hoban is sort of like a muskrat, you know, he's square face, sort of like mine, big glasses. And he sat down and the first quest, I thought, what magnificent erudite intellectual question is going to come out of his mouth? And Rob and uh, Russell Hoban said to Robertson Davis, pencil or pen? And we began from there. <laughs> And, and, and it was fascinating what he said. His answer was fascinating. And I've, I'm always kind of amazed at how perennially interesting the simplest questions are. Uh, because when you get people who've made careers out of the choice they made, out of a pencil or a pen, then the answer has to be interesting. So my question for both of you is this. Something brought you to the threshold of thinking, I can do this. And I'm, by that, I mean some book or some author somebody you connected with early on that said, I can see myself in the imaginary company of this person, even if they're dead or even if I never meet them, I can see myself at least on the same subway car with, mm -hmm. you know, respectfully. And so I want to ask both of you, if you, if you can think of who that person or who that writer or creator might be, it's kind of a Mr. White question, but it's really more about the finished object rather than the teacher. I think I have mine, Anne. Shall I go first? Oh, think... please, yes. So, again, it's a childhood thing. I think a lot of these things form 
in childhood, right? But I remember, um, um, I, 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 I love reading Asterix books by uh, uh, Gossini and, and Adurzo. I'm not sure the 100% of the pronunciation. But I, my nan bought me uh, from the library, what was it called? It was a book about the making of Asterix books. So it had the history of Asterix. And, and I remember seeing in that um, book, a black and white photo of Albert Adurzo, the artist of those books, working in his studio, surrounded by paint and pencils and and I just thought that man does that every day it's like that's what he, he that's his job you know I think that was the first time that I realized this being an illustrator is a job it's something that you could do and get paid for and it could be your career I was about I don't know nine or ten when I got this book and I just remember thinking that looks like a very happy life, like drawing every day, coming up with stories, coming up with characters, because he was an author as well. Um, you know, and just kind of being creative for hours and hours every day for seven days a week. And I think I remember thinking I could do that. That's something I could do. And um, every time I sort of think, you know, uh, you know, can I do this? You know, is this, is this for me? I'm, you know, I'm, you know, when when a project's maybe not going as well as it could do, I sometimes think of that photo and it kind of reignites that spark of like why I why I wanted to do it. It was the simplicity of just sitting in a studio and sort of just getting in that zone and letting mm-hmm. kind of time disappear and the outside world disappear and just kind of creating really. So yeah, Albert Adazo, I think is my is my inspiration. Um, I'm going to answer very quickly, and then I'm going to ask a question. My, for me, it was Eudora Welty, and it was because as a child, probably in seventh grade, we had a great big English textbook of short stories, and they would have the author's name and then a parenthesis, birth date slash date of death. And she was the only woman in the book wow. and the only one who wasn't dead. It was her birthday, a slash, then an empty space, and then the closed parenthesis. And I oh, wow. thought, no. oh, okay. I can, you know, I never thought that it was a job that was open, that was still open. That she was the person that alerted me to the fact that I could be alive and be a writer. So somebody said to me once that a writer was someone who couldn't make it as a painter. And... <laughs> For me, there is a ton of truth in that. When I went to graduate school, I was enrolled in a double MFA program in printmaking and creative writing, and I failed out of the printmaking department. Um, And I knew always, even when I was really young, that I had a chance to be a very good writer, but I never had a chance to be a very good painter. Gregory, take it from there. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yet, yet another another a bit of convergence between our, our lives yeah. are, are surprisingly identical, even though we, we grew up in different parts of the world, different parts of the nation anyway. Um, I too started out with ambitions to be an, to be an artist, to be an illustrator yeah. specifically, because mm-hmm. I love books so much and I love the pictures and books. Uh, when I got out of uh, undergraduate school, I applied to RISD, and I applied to the Simmons College Center for the Study of Children's Literature, which was a new oh, master's wow. degree program. Uh, that's where Jane Langton was teaching. I got into both and I decided I had, I had more talent with my mm-hmm. pen than with my brush. I had more talent yeah. with my typewriter than with uh, my Higgins ink and my, and my rapidograph, even though I loved, loved, loved doing both. But um, if you could, if you could like get one wish, if you could be a great, a truly great painter or a truly great writer, David, you got to, you got to weigh in on this too. Yeah. Oh, and only one. <laughs> yeah. Only one. If you, you know, we all, we've yep. all done yeah. quite well I, in the one that we got. Yeah. <laughs> so rich. I think, I, I, oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, no. I just, I just want to see 
the 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 Gregory Maguire author illustrator book. I think you could. It's, <laughs> I, it's still I in you, surely. You. I remember yeah. uh, I, you sent me this was so many years ago a copy of Wicked for Greg, Gregory and I have a relationship that's based on uh, charitable favors. You know, right. can you support my charity and <laughs> I support your charity. I was raising okay. some money for something, and you yeah. sent me a copy of Wicked and you drew. A witch it was all colored in, and I thought, "Damn, son! You know, you wow. may have really missed your calling." That was really something. I'd love to see that. That'd be amazing. <laughs> well, I, I would. I still would like to be a better writer than I am. I mean, well, yeah, that goes. Me, and, yes, I would and, like that too. And um, and now I'm going to answer my own question about the book that made me feel like okay. I. Okay. All right. Because actually, the answer. Only I hadn't asked it to myself, but the answer occurred to me as I was listening to the two of you. And that is that for all the great fantasies that really gave me uh, an emotional life support system in my, in my pleasant and, and somewhat troubled childhood, uh, the book that I, I, I didn't really believe in Narnia. I wanted to believe in Narnia. I tried to. I pretended I did, but I didn't really. Um, Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland, the, the fairy tales, all the early things that I think really gave me access to windows from which I could escape my reality and, and into which I could return were my, were my ideal and my life support and why I've written fantasy most of my life. But the book that turned me into a writer was, of course, same as the book that turned Alison Bechdel into a writer and any number of other people, Harriet the Spy. Because right. alone of the books that I read when I was a child, that was a realistic story. And the childhood character was not just very real, but she was very intent on being a writer. And I emulated her practices. I mean, I became a spy. I became a journalist. I, I, I had a spy notebook like Harriet, my spy route, which right. eventually morphed into a journal once I got old enough to be embarrassed calling it a spy notebook <laughs> and I still keep it. I've been keeping it for 57, 58 years oh, now not every day, not every day, but I, it's just, I have channeled in my life into those mm -hmm. pages and the practice of keeping a journal helped me become a writer because it's looking and seeing and writing down what you don't understand rather than what you do. That really sharpens, I think your mind in thinking about that. I was thinking, well, here we are with Cress Watercress, because David, you said Cress and Mama were your favorite characters. And in some ways, Cress and Mama are the most realistic characters, even though they're mm -hmm. rabbits dressed in clothes. Yeah. All the other characters I was thinking as I was listening to you are like the are like the adult characters in Harriet, who are all kind of over the top. They're all mm -hmm. they're all see they're all slightly parodic because that's how kids see adults. They see sure. them as as going inside their own lines. And in a way, the the bear, the skunk, the chinchilla, um, the snake, uh, they're all they're all slightly larger than life, whereas Cress and Mama are the solid moral center of experience yeah. from which truth cannot be denied. Absolutely. Oh, that's so good. That's so beautiful. Um, and we should probably invite Eric back to see if there are audience questions. And if they're not, we'll just keep going. Yes, and, and if there are, we can just keep going because you're going so beautifully, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my gosh, it's, uh, it's uh, just an honor to be eavesdropping on this conversation uh, for all of us who are, who are wrapped uh, with attention. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm gonna start with my question because it just builds so beautifully off what Gregory uh, just said, uh, something I've loved about your writing is how you write about such flawed people, but how deeply we feel for them and, and sort of how open, the, the, something about their world opens beyond their, you know, what, they're, what they seem to be in the book for. And, uh, and so many of the characters you just named are like that. In fact, David, I don't know, feel free to throw up a, um, uh, a portrait of uh, Lady Agatha Cabbage, or or any of these characters, but Gregory, how how do you how do you do that? How do you take these characters that 
are at risk of being one dimensional and they become uh, so rich in, in the book and in our minds. I have to say, at the risk of sounding as if I believe in magical writing, and I don't, uh, after 44 years of being in, in print, uh, I have learned to trust the uh, the smell test pretty early. I mean, some people would say, "Oh no, the whole thing stinks." You know, you, you never you got to get your nose checked. But I've learned I've learned to kind of test drive a line as it comes out of my fingers uh, for for some kind of emotional veracity. Uh, and so if a character behaves like one way in one chapter, I know that I'm still learning about that character too. And that the character, you know, there are no characters who only show up once in this book. They all have two or three appearances. And when they come back, something has happened to each one. I don't mean to say they've they've gone on you know, going to a missionary camp and seeing the light or anything, sometimes they're messier, <laughs> but they have, but they have continued to live their lives and have experiences. And as Cress, Cress is moving from seeing people in silhouette to seeing them as more full of possibility, because that's what she's moving for herself too. Mm. <laughs> oh, there she is. Uh, <laughs> what a skunk. <laughs> <laughs> This, Gregory, do you just take huge pleasure in looking at that picture and thinking, I mean, that's really the best of your talent and intelligence with David's talent and intelligence. That skunk in that picture is better than just the skunk you wrote. Um, it, it is such a, a thrilling confluence of talent. Do you, do you just get such a charge out well, of that? I, yes, yes. I, I, I like, I have a low, low voltage, you know, I have to be grounded. I have to ground myself, you know, with, with one of those little <laughs> machines I walk around with whenever I have to look at this book. And, and because the skunk is so arresting, only as you throw it up on the screen right now, David, do I notice the creatures in the lower right. I mean, because sure. she's, she's like on the catwalk, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, I've, I, until I've seen this right now, I haven't even noticed that because she's so mesmerizing there with her lorgnette and her chinchilla. Sure. It's, um, it's, 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 well, arresting is is really the best word, and I think I've already used it. But it that is. chinchilla, that chinchilla is is just such a fantastic character. <laughs> really, maybe my favorite. And, so, and, Greg, oh, will, you, will you? Is this is this someone you know? Is this a character that you know? In, I, in think, life? I think Lady Agatha Cabot shows up in virtually every single one of my books. But, <laughs> right. Uh, hold on just a minute. Are you going out? <laughs> okay, see you later. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, now that I just made that comment about Harriet, I remember that the, the lady in the bed who won't get out of bed for love near money and is so rich, the one that, that Harriet spies on, the dumbwaiter, her first name is Agatha. It's Agatha. Oh, Cameron. wow, there we go. So <laughs> who, knows? who knows what you're channeling? Uh, yeah. at, at the risk of sounding like, like I'm uh, throwing around names, one of my really dear friends for many years was Maurice Sendak. And oh, wow. he and I wow. used to talk about accessing the subconscious when one is creating things. And, and he said, the more of yourself you can let go and the, and the more silent you can be, the easier it is to access that which your subconscious says is what the story is really about. And while I can't say and turn, you know, turn to StreamYard you know, in the after show to find out three easy ways to access your, self, your, your subconscious, I can't say how it's done. I just know that as I get older and older and older, I feel more and more confident that my instincts know more than I do. And I, and I follow them. And so each of these characters, including late Lady Agatha Cabbage, uh, comes onto the page and then something happens. For instance, when in, in this scene, she says, and I'm gonna sort of quote, not verbatim, she says, oh, <laughs> no, it's so fabulous to be me. Notice my lorgnette, notice my chinchilla, and then my fingers wrote, the chinchilla raised his head and said, hi there. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be a talking chinchilla until it raised its head and said, hi there. 
And that's right. what I mean by going by instinct. It just, the moment called for a ba bum and yeah. for, for a second of, of repast. And the instinct is a wonderful thing to have. But as you know, Anne and David, I suspect maybe you do too, I'm not sure. Very often you call for it and it's, it's actually out to lunch that day and no. you have to do the best you can anyway. Right. Yeah, sure. I'm just starstruck that you said send, send that and you were friends and yeah. that's incredible. Long story, yeah. but yeah. You know, He's what a wonderful, idol. Eric, take note, what a wonderful program it would be to just have Gregory telling Sindak stories for oh, now. Yes, oh, yes, please. I mean, really, what a valuable record that would be, sit in front of your computer and tell us everything you remember. Yeah. Well, tell us the yeah. Sindak, tell us the story. Come on, tell us something good. Well, <laughs> The, the, and you will you will get the feeling of this. And David, if you're not here yet, I know you will by looking at your work. Uh, one day we were about to go on a panel together. I was going to interview him at, at MIT or something. And uh, he was famously curmudgeonly, but a lot of that was an act. Uh, right. he, he turned and, and he said, or maybe this was even on stage he said this. That doesn't, it doesn't matter. He said, you know, I've done 109 books and when I die, all they're going to say is, that guy who made the wild things is dead. Finally. <laughs> he said, that's all they're going to say. They're not going to talk about the other 108 books, just wild things. No. He, sat there, he sat there glumly. And then he perked up and said, on the other hand, at least they're going to say something. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we talked about being, being, being somewhat plagued by, we, you know, we, we joked about it wild things and witches, you know, that in fact, mm -hmm. if you have done something for that to which your name has become attached, it can be hard to get out from under its shadow. Uh, and it, it can take a lot of effort, a lot of psychological effort, if you're, uh, if you're so inclined to say, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not done just because I've done something that people have heard of. I'm not, I'm not done. The noise in my, in my own head is still speaking to me. And now my job is to block out the noise of the commercial world and the noise of a fan base and the noise of, can I top myself? You know, all those self-guessing, second-guessing things you do and say, no, what is the question that I really need to ask right now in this my life? In this my life, mm -hmm. what's the question? So, I, David, I, I don't know whether you're there yet because you're substantially younger than I am, but mark my words, my boy, you will be. Because <laughs> Well, I have a book. Yeah. I have a book called The Bear and the Piano. And yes, I, I, sure every do. Book, every <laughs> book I do is yeah. like, can we have another Bear and the Piano, please? And I'm like, well, you know. But hey, where the wild things are, you know, if that's all he ever gets remembered for, that's that changed a lot of kids' lives. That book. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, not, not bad going, really. For, for all, all three of you, I know I speak for readers everywhere that we're profoundly grateful that you did push on past uh, <laughs> momentary uh, uh, success and kept finding new areas to explore. Uh, Gregory, David, what you've done in Crest Watercress is astounding. Uh, I think it's such a marvelous book. It's so exciting to be here with you to celebrate it. Um, our hour is up, but I want to remind our audience that uh, they can purchase a copy, and uh, by the way, many people notice that their, Gregory has been able to sign a few copies and get those routed through the, the supply chain, as it were, so mm -hmm. some of you will be getting those signed books. Yes. Oh. Um, and I also want to uh, mention that we have uh, many other great author events coming up, and that in one month, it's Independent Bookstore Day in the United States, and we'll be celebrating that here in Minnesota, uh, uh, Rain Taxi will be pr publishing its annual independent bookstore passport uh, this year with special support from the Givens Foundation for African American Literature, Gray Wolf Press, and the University of Minnesota Press, uh, and many other local publishers and organizations and our great bookstores uh, to celebrate this vital community. Ann Patchett, thank you so much for leading this conversation. What a joy. Uh, to, every, to all of you and to everyone watching out there and who will be watching in the future, thank you for being with us. Good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.